He wasn't a general, yet he commanded the motions of planets. He wasn't a king, yet Napoleon himself bowed to his mind. While revolutions burned cities to the ground, he quietly rewrote the laws that hold the universe together. No fame, no fortune, no loud victories. Just a solitary genius taking on problems even Newton left behind. Today, his equations guide spacecraft, stabilize worlds, and define modern physics. This is Joseph Louis Lagrange, the hidden architect of mechanics. Joseph Louis Lagrange was born on January 25, 1736, in Turin, into a family of mixed French and Italian descent. His French ancestry came from his grandfather, a cavalry captain who had entered the service of the King of Sardinia. His father, once treasurer of war for Sardinia, had married the daughter of a wealthy physician. Eleven children were born into the family, but only the youngest, Joseph Louis, survived beyond infancy. Although the family began wealthy, Lagrange's father was an incurable speculator, and by the time Joseph Louis was old enough to inherit, the fortune had disappeared. Lagrange later remarked that this loss was the luckiest thing that had happened to him, saying that if he had inherited a fortune, he probably would not have devoted himself to mathematics. In school, Lagrange's interests were first in classical studies. His early contact with Euclid and Archimedes did not greatly impress him. What changed the direction of his life was an essay by Edmund Halley comparing the power of calculus with the synthetic geometry of the Greeks. This work captivated him and he taught himself the mathematics that was modern in his time. According to Delambre, possibly with slight inaccuracy, Lagrange became professor of mathematics at the Royal Artillery School in Turin at the age of 16. All of his students were older than he was. He organized the more capable among them into a small research society from which the Turin Academy of Sciences eventually developed. The first volume of the Academy's memoirs appeared in 1759 when Lagrange was 23. It is generally believed that Lagrange himself contributed much of the important mathematics in these early papers, even when published under the names of others. Lagrange's own early work included a memoir on maxima and minima, an early form of what would later be called the calculus of variations. In it, he announced his intention to develop a work from which the entire subject of mechanics, of both solids and fluids, could be deduced. This idea, conceived when he was 19, became the foundation of his later mechanique analytique. In the same early period, Lagrange also applied the differential calculus to the theory of probability, advanced the mathematical theory of sound beyond Newton's fluid-based approach, and settled the long-standing controversy over the vibrating string by analyzing the system of elastic particles involved. By the age of 23, Lagrange was recognized as the equal of the leading mathematicians of the era, including Euler and the Bernoulli, Euler, in particular, reacted with exceptional generosity. When Lagrange sent some of his first work as a young man, Euler immediately recognized its merit and encouraged him to continue. Four years later, when Lagrange sent Euler the correct method for isoperimetric problems, something Euler had struggled with for years, Euler acknowledged that Lagrange's method had allowed him to overcome difficulties that had seemed insurmountable. Euler even delayed publishing his own results so that Lagrange could claim priority. He went further still, helping secure Lagrange's election as a foreign member of the Berlin Academy on October 2, 1759, when Lagrange was 23. This recognition played an important role in establishing his reputation in Turin and abroad. Lagrange arrived in Berlin on November 6, 1766, at the age of 30. Frederick the Great welcomed him warmly, calling himself 
the greatest king in Europe, and stating that he was honoured to have at his court the greatest mathematician. Lagrange became director of the Physico-Mathematical Division of the Berlin Academy. He was not required to lecture and devoted himself almost entirely to research. For 20 years he filled the Academy's memoirs with major contributions. During these years, Lagrange made substantial advances in celestial mechanics. In 1764, he received the grand prize of the French Academy of Sciences for his solution of the problem of the libration of the moon, which involved an application of the Newtonian three-body problem. In 1766, he again won the Academy's prize for work on the inequalities of Jupiter's satellites. In 1772, he won the prize once more for a memoir on the three-body problem. Further prizes followed in 1774 and 1778 for work on the motion of the moon and on cometary perturbations. Lagrange's most important single work had been conceived before his arrival in Berlin. It was the Mécanique Analytique, the project he had first imagined as a young man. In a letter of 1782 to Laplace, Lagrange wrote that he had almost completed a treatise on analytical mechanics based on a principle expressed in one of his earlier memoirs. In the preface to this work, he stated plainly, no diagrams will be found in this work. And he noted humorously that mechanics may be considered the geometry of a four-dimensional space, three spatial coordinates and one time coordinate, an interpretation that later became common after Einstein's work in 1915. The Mécanique Analytique was eventually printed in Paris in 1788, after Lagrange left Berlin. Lagrange's working habits contributed both to the quality of his work and to the deterioration of his health. From his letters, it is clear that he repeatedly rewrote his memoirs until he was satisfied with them. Between the ages of 16 and 26, excessive application to study had seriously damaged his digestion and for the rest of his life, he was forced to discipline himself in matters of health. Correspondence with D'Alembert reveals D'Alembert's repeated efforts to make Lagrange care for his health and Lagrange's tendency to overwork in spite of it. Lagrange married while in Berlin. According to one account, he arranged for a young female relative from Turin to join him and married her largely for practical reasons. Lagrange himself described the marriage as something he had not particularly planned and referred to it as inconsequential when explaining to D'Alembert why he had not mentioned it earlier. His wife became ill not long afterward. Lagrange attended her personally and gave up sleep to nurse her. After her death, he found consolation in his work, noting that his occupations were reduced to cultivating mathematics, tranquilly and in silence. Not all of Lagrange's work in Berlin concerned mechanics. His investigations into algebra, particularly the theory of equations, were of great long-term importance. In his 1767 memoir on the solution of numerical equations, and in later editions, he examined the structure of algebraic solutions by analyzing permutations of the roots of equations and the conditions under which an equation remains invariant under such permutations. This approach marked the beginning of what later became the theory of finite groups. He showed that for equations of degree 2, 3 and 4, the known algebraic solutions could be understood through a uniform method involving equations of lower degree. However, when applying the same procedure to the general equation of degree 5, the resolvent equation turned out to be of degree 6, making the method ineffective. The obstruction revealed by Lagrange's analysis was later central to the development of the work of Cauchy, Abel and Galois. By the time of Frederick the Great's death in 1786, increasing resentment toward foreigners and a general decline in support for science made Berlin uncomfortable for Lagrange. He obtained release from his post on the condition that he continue sending memoirs to the Academy for several years, a condition he accepted. He then accepted Louis XVI's invitation to move to Paris, bringing his 20 years in Berlin to a close. In Paris, he was received with great respect by the royal family and the academy. He was provided with comfortable quarters in the Louvre. Marie Antoinette, 
nearly 19 years younger than Lagrange, became a particular supporter of his. Nevertheless, at this time, Lagrange entered a period of profound melancholy. He had become indifferent to mathematics. At Lavoisier's scientific meetings, he would sometimes stand with his back to the room, looking out of a window, showing little interest in the discussions taking place behind him. When the French Revolution began, Lagrange's indifference was interrupted. After the fall of the Bastille in July 1789, friends urged him to return to Berlin, where he would have been welcomed, but he refused, saying that he preferred to remain in Paris and observe the experiment. Neither he nor those around him foresaw the severity of the coming events. The execution of Lavoisier in 1794 particularly affected him. In response, Lagrange remarked, it took them only a moment to cause that head to fall, and a hundred years perhaps will not suffice to produce its like. In 1795, when the École Normale was established, he was appointed Professor of Mathematics. Although the school's first existence was brief, Lagrange lectured there. When the École Polytechnique was founded in 1797, he defined its mathematics curriculum and became its first professor. He had not previously taught, but adapted his instruction to the poorly prepared students. He led them from arithmetic and algebra into analysis, and his lectures included new mathematical developments as they progressed. Despite his activities, Lagrange remained solitary and inclined to melancholy until, at the age of 56, he married the daughter of the astronomer Lemonnier. According to the account in the text, she had been moved by his unhappiness and insisted upon marrying him. This marriage was successful. His wife was devoted and took active interest in restoring his desire to live. She persuaded him to accompany her to social occasions he would not have attended alone and they became inseparable. During her brief absences, he was distressed. In this later period, he stated that of all his successes, the one he valued most was having such a companion. In the years following the revolution, Lagrange received a series of distinctions from Napoleon. Napoleon made him a senator, a count of the empire, and a grand officer of the Legion of Honor. When France annexed Piedmont in 1796, Talleyrand was instructed to visit Lagrange's father in Turin and inform him that, your son, whom Piedmont is proud to have produced and France to possess, has done honor to all mankind by his genius. In his 70s, Lagrange undertook the revision and extension of the Mécanique Analytique for a second edition. During this period, he experienced fainting spells, particularly when rising from bed. On one occasion, his wife found him unconscious on the floor with a severe head injury from striking the edge of a table. As his health declined, Lagrange regarded death without anxiety. Two days before he died, some of his friends, including Monge, visited him. He told them that he had recently experienced a period in which he believed he was going to die. He remarked, in a few moments there will be no more functions anywhere. Death will be everywhere. Death is only the absolute repose of the body. Shortly after his friends left, another fainting spell occurred. This time he did not regain consciousness. Lagrange died on the morning of April 10th, 1813, in his 76th year. Joseph Louis Lagrange left the world as he had lived in it, gently, without display, and with a mind still seeking clarity until the final moment. He asked for little, gave much, and changed the course of mathematics with a steady hand and a quiet spirit. Behind the equations was a man who endured loneliness, found companionship late, weathered revolution, and devoted his life to understanding the order hidden within the world. His work lives on, his influence endures, and the calm voice he brought to the science of motion still speaks to us today across two centuries of discovery. This is the legacy of Lagrange, simple, profound and lasting.